This man was no longer the richest man in the world in 2023. Tesla stock plummeting, more rocket explosions, and the Twitter fiasco made Elon the biggest loser of 2022. This was actually record-breaking and made Elon the only person in history to lose a staggering $200 billion in net worth in one year. This unprecedented drop bumped the second richest man in the world back to the top, Bernard Arnault, with a net worth of $211 billion. Wait, who? If you don't know who he was, it's quite understandable since he didn't own a social media profile, unlike Elon, obviously, but we bet you'd recognize this logo, or this. Maybe this? Or heck, any of these. That's right, Bernard Arnault was the founder and CEO of Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, or LVMH, and this group was massive. Dominance over the timeless luxury goods industry was the key to his success, even earning him the ominous moniker of the wolf in Kashmir due to his ruthless and cunning business strategies. But how did Arnault get here? Today, we explore the life and times of Bernard Arnault, a story of a visionary filled with backstabbing and intrigue, all carefully executed to establish the biggest fashion empire ever. Welcome to Gritflix, the channel that provides you with high-quality documentaries covering money, power, and business. Stay gritty, and this is Bernard Arnault, the richest man in the world. Early Start Bernard Arnault was born on March 5, 1949, in Robay, France, an industrial city on the borders near Belgium. His father, Jean-Léon Arnault, owned a successful construction firm called Ferret Savinel. A love of France and a spirit of entrepreneurship were instilled in young Arnault, who enjoyed a privileged upbringing. He later followed his father's footsteps and graduated École Polytechnique in Paris with an engineering degree. Armed with knowledge and ambition, Arnault set out his early career working for his father's construction firm in 1971. Three years later, Arnault convinced his father to pivot into the growing real estate industry, selling off their construction business into developing specialty holiday accommodations. The company grew over the years and, with Arnault as its president, eventually changed its name to Farinelle Inc. in 1979. Arnault's business instincts were sharpened, but deep down, he's not satisfied. He dreamed of leading a business worthy of a legacy. All he needed now was for the right opportunity to come along. The birth of the wolf in Kashmir The opportunity Arnault was waiting for finally came in 1984, when he heard that the French government was looking for a company to take over Boussac saint frères a bankrupt conglomerate with a massive portfolio in textile and retail, including Christian Dior. Arnault was captivated by the idea of taking over Christian Dior, believing it to be undervalued with tons of potential. So Arnault set out to join the government bid. To be eligible though, Arnault needed to own a company in a relevant industry, so he went on the hunt and found Financier Agache, a luxury goods company, who offered a selling price of $80 million. Undeterred, Arnault put up $15 million of his own money and raised the remaining $65 million with help from Antoine Bernheim, the managing partner of French bank Lazare Fairs & Co. Now its CEO, Arnault was able to enter and win the bidding war for Boussac. Paying a ceremonial one franc, Arnault finally took over control of Boussac saint Fers. Arnault demonstrated his cunning and turned the bankrupt company around. He laid off 9,000 workers over two years and sold off all of the company's assets, keeping mainly Christian Dior. This allowed him to focus on growing a smaller portfolio. His business instincts and ruthless personality enabled him to lead Boussac into profitability in only three years, reporting a revenue stream of $1.9 billion by 1987. Arnault had his first taste of success in fashion, and he wanted more. Way, way more. The LVMH Founder Arnault was a visionary. He saw that wealth was rapidly growing around the world, creating a demand for high-quality products products that became a fashion statement for the users, marking them as elite one percenters. Meeting their aspirational needs was the name of the game, a game that Arnault would thrive in. In 1987, Arnault set out to execute his vision to establish a powerful group with high-end portfolio of luxury and other aspirational brands such as high-end watches, liqueur, and perfumes. Enter Henri Racamier and Alain Chevalier, Chevalier was the CEO of Moet Hennessy, while Henri Racamier was the president of Louis Vuitton. Both men had secured a $4 billion merger, allowing LV to expand its portfolio while saving Moet Hennessy from a hostile takeover. But this was not a match made in heaven. 
Rakamier felt threatened by Moe Hennessy, suspecting them of conspiring to take over his own company. To consolidate his power against Chevalier, Rakamier invited Arnaud to invest in LVMH and become an ally. Both men's power was enough to overpower Chevalier, forcing him to quit LVMH. Rakamier succeeded in stabilizing the company, or so he thought. You see, Arnaud saw these interval struggles had weakened LVMH. He then realized if he played his cards right, he could claim LVMH for himself. Over two years, Arnaud slowly built his positions to obtain a 45% controlling shares in LVMH and secured the support of Moe Hennessy, who had an axe to grind with Rakamier for getting them into this mess in the first place. Once he had enough voting rights, Arnaud staged a coup and ousted Rakamier from LVMH forever. Finally, Arnaud was unanimously elected chairman of the executive management board of LVMH. The Luxury Lord LVMH was the power base Arnaud needed to rise to the top of the luxury industry. He wasted no time expanding the company's portfolio even further. He knew Asia, especially China, had the highest potential to grow economically and created wealthier customers, his ideal target market. Arnaud proceeded to unveil LVMH's first Louis Vuitton boutique in Beijing's Palace Hotel in 1992, overcoming strict import regulations and distribution. The Asian market proved receptive and grew to account almost half of LVMH's global sales by 1996. Business was booming. Not one to rest on his haunches, the wolf in Kashmir proceeded on a slew of acquisitions over the years. LVMH acquired Tag Heuer, Zenith, Sephora, Fendi, and more. A storm of acquisitions, both hostile and amicable, leading to this impressive portfolio today. Among them, Bulgari, Hublot, Tiffany & Co., Make Up Forever, Givenchy, Marc Jacobs, and Dom Perignon. If you thought of luxury goods, at least one of these brands would come to mind. This begged the question, what weren't on the list? Arnaud might be the luxury lord, but he's not yet the monopoly king. From his experience taking over LVMH, Arnaud had perfected a simple four-step formula for hostile takeovers. First, he bought a substantial predatory stake in a target business. Second, he promised that his intentions were friendly and he's not interested in taking over the company. Third, he engineered internal strife within the target company. Fourth, he made an offer they can't refuse. Like a modern-day robber baron, this bold and clever strategy worked in his favor in dozens of corporate raids, except for two brands, Gucci and Hermes. And here's why. The Gucci Gambit January 5th, 1999. Gucci CEO Domenico De Sol was on a flight from New York to London. It had been a great year for Gucci. De Sol, along with his rock star designer Tom Ford, had taken Gucci from near bankruptcy in 1993 to a massive $1.04 billion in revenue in 1998, an 11% increase from the year before. His reverie was suddenly interrupted by a phone call from an old friend, Yves Carcel. He soon realized Carcel, an LVMH director, wasn't calling just to catch up. In a serious tone, he informed the Soul that LVMH had acquired a 5% stake in Gucci and that Arnaud, who ordered the purchase, did not have hostile intentions over Gucci. In fact, Carcel hoped that Gucci and LVMH would maintain friendly relations and found ways to work together. The Soul couldn't believe what he was hearing. He knew there was no way Arnaud only wanted friendly relations. In fact, this was step one and two of Arnaud's trademark strategy. De Sol needed to go on the defense, or else. Sure enough, within two weeks, Arnaud upped his stakes in Gucci to 26.7%, almost a quarter of the whole company. Arnaud not only scooped up any Gucci stocks in the open market, but also convinced Prada chairman Patricio Bertelli to sell his. Bertelli had acquired 9.5% Gucci shares a few years back for $260 million and sold it to Arnaud for $390 million for a $140 million profit. A pretty good trade for Bertelli, but a nightmare for De Sol. De Sol needed to gain control of the situation, so he arranged a meeting with Arnaud in Morgan Stanley's Paris office, who had been advising Gucci on anti-takeover measures. De Sol requested Arnaud to stop buying more Gucci shares and allow them to remain independent. Arnaud was actually open to the request, that was, until he dropped a bombshell. He requested three board seats on Gucci. De Sol firmly refused the strong-armed offer. No deal was made that day. Arnaud, realizing De Sol was tougher than he first thought, decided to up the stakes. 
Just a few days later, news broke that LVMH had acquired more shares, bringing the total to a massive 34.4% stake. 34.4% wasn't made by accident. No, no, no. Arnaud knew a Gucci secret and leveraged it. You see, there was a Gucci clause stating Tom Ford was allowed to resign without breaching his contract if an individual shareholder amassed a 35% ownership stake. Arnaud was taunting they sold. He wanted they sold to stress and fight with Ford, a solid step three move. Unfortunately for Arnaud, it ended up making Ford and they sold more determined than ever. They were united against a common enemy and they realized there's only one way out of this. Gucci needed an investor to buy out a majority of shares and block out LVMH. Given Arnaud's reputation, very few in the fashion business dared to help Gucci. They so called dozens of investors, but many refused. Gucci was running out of time. They so realized then that he needed to stall Arnaud. Facing him head on, De so decided to dilute Arnaud's stock to zero. He could neutralize Arnaud's influence by printing new shares. A suicidal move because issuing new shares meant that all shareholders, they so included, would see their share values drop significantly. But of course, this would hurt Arnaud the most since he's currently the largest shareholder. In February 1999, Gucci issued 20 million new shares across their employees as part of a massive employee stock ownership plan. In one fell swoop, they so diluted Arnaud's position from 34.4% to roughly 25%. Bernard was pissed but this was where his usual strategy crumbled. A month later, Francois Pinot, another wealthy French conglomerate who owned many businesses, including Christie's Auction House, Samsonite's, and Converse Brands, joined the fray and bought Gucci. This was the result of an intense negotiation between Desol and Pinot, who was happy to let Gucci be independent. Desol issued another 40 million shares at $75 a share for Pinot to scoop out with $3 billion, giving him 42% stake and diluting Arnaud even further to 19.6%. Arnaud was blindsided. He resentfully moved to block the deal and offered to buy out the entire company for $8.7 billion instead. But Desol wouldn't have it. Now, Gucci had the upper hand and they wouldn't let Arnaud in. He had no choice but to move on and sold any remaining stocks in late 2001. Arnaud had completely lost the battle for Gucci. The Hermes Hijacking It was October 2010. Patrick Thomas, the CEO of Hermes, was cycling through the French Alps. While enjoying the beautiful sights, his thoughts were interrupted by a sudden phone call from none other than Arnaud. It was a courtesy call informing Thomas that LVMH would soon announce that they had acquired a 17% stake in Hermes. Thomas felt like he took a punch in the gut. At the time, Hermes was still a family company owned by the Pueck, Dumas, and Gurens, who controlled a combined 70% stake. To Thomas, Arnaud's call was a declaration of war. Red hot with anger, Thomas shot back at Arnaud. If you want to seduce a beautiful woman, you don't start by b***ing her from behind. So began a decade-long battle between LVMH and Hermes. How did a giant company like Hermes not see this coming? Surely a sudden 17% stake in their company would have raised some eyebrows long before it happened. Turned out Arnaud had leveraged a simple loophole. You see, LVMH started out buying shares in Hermes back in 2001 to 2002 for 4.9%. In France, companies were only forced to disclose their purchase when they acquired a higher than 5% stake in a public company. LVMH was able to secretly work under the radar and slowly build up their positions. Arnaud learned from his experience with Gucci and operated more sneakily. Adding to the subterfuge, LVMH built their positions through equity derivatives via intermediaries and subsidiaries, which effectively exempted them from having to disclose their holdings. Equity swaps were often used, where LVMH traded their own equities for a stake in Hermes. By 2010, LVMH finally built a sizable foothold in Hermes and the first step was complete. Throughout the process, LVMH executives such as Vice President Pierre Gold maintained a narrative that they weren't out to take over Hermes, stating, LVMH has no intention of aggressively taking control of Hermes. I make the wish that these artificial, sterile, and groundless quarrels stop. Not that anybody believed him, they all knew Arnaud had done it before as part of his strategy. News about LVMH's investment in Hermes had triggered a storm. The Autorité des Marches Financières, or AMF, France's SEC, entered the fray a month later, announcing that an investigation was underway. 
In January 2011, the AMF released a ruling allowing the Hermes family owners to pool their assets and restricting LVMH from buying out minority shareholders, blocking their attempts to build stronger positions. Despite the rulings, however, in December 31, 2011, LVMH announced that they managed to raise their stake to 22.6%. But how? Speculations rose that Arnaud bought out shares from Hermes family members. The seed he'd sown to create internal strife was bearing fruit. The third step was in motion. It was only later in 2020 when the AMF revealed Nicolas Puek from the Puek branch of the Hermes family was the one who sold 5.8% of his shares to Arnaud. Puek denied the findings but was unable to clarify the matter. Interestingly, Puek was the only family member who refused to join the Hermes holdings during the takeover battle, claiming Arnaud's investment wasn't a serious threat. Suspicious much? Unfortunately for Arnaud, this was when his signature strategy faltered yet again. Before he made an offer Hermes can't refuse, Hermes upped the stakes in July 2012 with a criminal complaint against LVMH in a Paris court, accusing them of insider trading, collusion, and stock price manipulation. Two months later, LVMH shot back with another criminal complaint of their own, citing blackmail, slander, and unfair competition. Luxury was a serious business indeed. In October 2012, the AMF announced they had found evidence of wrongdoing by LVMH and requested the sanctions committee to decide a penalty. LVMH was backed into a corner. Arnaud attempted to evade the bullet in April 2013 during LVMH's annual general meeting, stating they came into holding Hermes shares unexpectedly. Like, seriously Arnaud? The axe finally fell on July 2013 when the AMF Sanctions Committee decided to penalize LVMH with a $10.4 million fine. LVMH never appealed the decision. In late 2014, LVMH finally announced they will not acquire Hermes shares for five years, then officially distributed their Hermes shares. The 23% stake, worth $7.5 billion at the time, were proportioned to various shareholders and investors, leaving less than 10% left among Arnaud and his family, effectively diluting their own position and voting rights. Arnaud officially lost the battle for Hermes. What's next? Despite these two setbacks, Arnaud succeeded way more often than he lost. A combination of clever financial engineering, business instinct, and grit had empowered him to grow LVMH into the luxury behemoth we know today. His ruthless climb to the top of the luxury industry earned him the title as the richest man in the world, cementing his name in history. So was Arnaud's journey an inspiring story of a fashion visionary, or was he nothing more than a ruthless, greedy corporate crushing everyone on his path to victory? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, check out our video on Dana White or on why Taiwan's chip dominance is under threat from China.